today's life, today's world, I would just say life in general. You know, you have to have something that utilizes your mind, body and spirits. You have to have something that has risk involved but is not actually dangerous if it is done properly. You have to be able to work something at the edge in order to get refinement rather than at the edge to, in order to get a thrill, if you see what I mean. So if you're going to push something as far as you can take it, I feel like karate is endless in that respect. There's always something you can evolve, there's always something you can get slightly better at. It's not just like, well, I'm doing it for self-defense and so I want to be better at defending myself because how do you grade that? You know, how do you say, well, yes, I'm there now. I can defend myself. You, you're never going to defend yourself against a surprise attack. So you've got to do the best you can and the best you can do is to create the potential to be excellent rather than I'm excellent now and I have it. And so it's not like a game where you win or you lose, you just, there's just degrees of how far you've refined your technique and how far you've sort of understood your body's limitations and abilities. And this is what it's for, of course, to, to keep your form and hit the makiwara, push and get the feedback through here and not to hit it like this. Why? Because sitting like this is not, not good for the makiwara. <laughs> You'll end up breaking it because it's, it's very, very strong and very, very accurate. So, well, why don't we do that and why do we do this? Well, you need to get the feedback because much of our time is spent, you know, honing our form. Feeling, for example, if I put my foot out, yeah, you feel a little bit of instability because the loins are not connected. So it's isolating certain little, uh, how can I say, impurities in the body and helping you to refine those away. When you move freely, what happens? Your center completely takes over, which is brilliant. But we don't have any cognizant thought about that. It's all like, ooh, why was that so strong? I felt kind of relaxed. But, you know, it just shows it way harder than I do when yes. I'm going for almost a full power Gakazuki. Awesome. So I'm slowing down to a stop. Yes. All right? So that's why when you're here, it might be good, but you don't want to drift there unless you have an ultra advanced level where, you know, you can be here, you decided to just let it spring back to here. So that would happen, of course, if you're in a situation. But to get there, you need to be able to do this ad nauseum, where it's just a pure, sort of natural, reflexive motion in, within the muscles, the chain of command. So to build that chain of command, you can't just say, yeah, got it, got it. It doesn't work that way. Of course, you have to be imbued in the system. I didn't look upon it as I'm going to sacrifice something. I looked upon it as, well, I'm on the planet once. This is what I'm drawn to. Where's the source? How can I have the most authentic experience? And I know, you know, the authentic experience is banded around a lot nowadays, but I really meant it back then in the, in the 80s, you know. I want authenticity, so I wanted to train rather than the British guys to train with the Japanese guys. Rather than just the one or two Japanese instructors that I got, you know, reasonably familiar with, well, let's go to the source. Let's go to where I'm surrounded by the Japanese because I need the atmosphere. Because of what you just said, really, it's like other people would say, well, you know, hang on, when are you gonna, how far are you gonna take this because you're giving up so much? I didn't see it as that way. So I wanted to be in an environment where people wouldn't question my commitment, if you like. And I, I felt Japan, because of the culture of the sort of ikigai, you know, where, you know, the raison d'etre culture, culture more than anywhere else, people would kind of just accept it at face value. This is what he does, he does karate. And, and I've always loved that idea of the old fashioned craftsman who is in the morning, he wakes up, he might have his breakfast, starts on his shoes, he's working the shoes, you know, night falls, time to go for a drink and you know, the, the day's over sort of thing. And uh, you know, how, how can you sort of satisfy your intellectual curiosity and your physical curiosity in something that's so otherworldly that you are transformed into a different person. So that, if that's a sacrifice, well, you know, I don't really see it as that. And then looking back, of course, um, it's, it's strange looking back because people who haven't done that, they think, well, you know, I've been doing karate for 30 years. Why shouldn't I be, you know, as respected as he is? And this and it's like, well, hang on, it's not the same thing. Because actually I did sacrifice everything, even though I don't look at it personally that way. Like, you didn't do that. 
you wanted your job and you wanted your normal life and everything else and you did a bit of karate on the side, and you, it, it's not commensurate with, with what I've done. So I try not to judge people on that, but it's, it's hard because uh, I, I recognize that you know, some people have talent and you know, some people have worked hard, but very, very few have set aside other distractions. And so rather than a sacrifice, I would say, you know, um, what's it like, you know, trying to get rid of as many distractions as possible? which is, of course, what you have at home. Yeah. You're using the rotation and suddenness that you have in Yankee, and also the upper, lower body diagonals to get that stability while you're on the hitch. <laughs> now, let's just go, let's go on through. Yes. Fire it out. Stop! <laughs> yeah, also, because you're rotating and then you're going to be on one leg, you don't want to risk your hand wandering off on the way back. So, front body, Front body, front body, back body. Okay, the back body is going to bring the arm back. Let's go on three. Yeah, the back body bring it back. Yeah. Some back body bring it back, so of course it's true with the lean The essence of Shotokan, for me, it's efficiency. And so, you know, you train on a large scale. Efficient in the same way that, you know, sort of weight training is efficient. It builds that muscle, but it, you, you've got to stack the odds against it to get that muscle built. So we saw the gun because of the scale of the movements, the large scale of the movements, then you're, for example, you know, just talking about the Sotoke, you know, we, as we were doing today, you know, boom, there's the block, but we've got to go through this whole process. So it's on a very, very big scale, which, the only way you can boil anything down is to start big and boil it down. If you start small, things tend to just get obscure and tight and it will take a very, very unique personality to be able to explore the intricate workings of that tiny movement. So we have that big scale of movement to boil it down to where it, the ultimate efficiency is when it's reflex from the core. So in order to find the core, you have to have the external and boil it away. So I guess, I never really thought about it before in those terms, but that's sort of where I'm thinking now. Try and, you know, isolate what's the most important thing. Is it the body, is it the arm? The body has to rotate, and that's the, the drawback of bringing your arm up is it's going to stop your body from rotating, so it's kind of like a, a distraction. Are you going to forget the body because you want to lift your arm up? Or can you still do the body and, you know, detach your mind and observe, oh, you know what, the arm came up. You don't deliberately do it and sacrifice the main core movement. And this was another thing with, uh, with me growing up, you know, I wasn't a, a natural talent, let's say. So although I was decent, you know, in my late teens, the big talents were you know, national champions at 19, 20 years old. So for me to be a year or two behind, I thought I can't possibly reach that level. But then I noticed that the Japanese champions were all 30. So I thought, well, okay, in 10 years, maybe, yeah, I could refine myself over the next 10 years to be way beyond what I am now. So I think with Asai Sensei, he went through that sort of post-war, like real military training that they had in the dojo. Got, you know, the, the nail that gets hammered down again and again over years and years with, with a very tough hierarchical system above him. And so when you have that core being built and drilled into you relentlessly and, and you know, pretty harshly, then your natural freedom comes out, the core's still there, so it's not haywire. But anyone that's too free early on without the discipline, you can't do it. I mean, any artist will, will be able to, let's say if you're a painter, you should be a good draftsman before you can do the abstract. And that's sort of how Asai Sensei was. Um, you know, the, the technical sort of building blocks were literally pounded into him. And then when he was free, he was free with a, a, a principal core, if you like. Yeah. Let's take you to the 